This week, we cross the Atlantic for a first non-U.S. warbird and a true workhorse of World War II, the Hawker Hurricane. Welcome to the Fighter Pile Podcast. Let's crank them up. Strap in for the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here's your host, former U.S. Air Force F-16 pilot, Trevor Boswell. Welcome, everyone. This is Boat coming back at you with another look into our Warbird series. So to start off, I'm on the men from a head cold. So if I do sound a bit stuffy, that's why. But hopefully you can forgive me on that one. And I'll press on so we can get to our featured interview with Warren Peach here in just a few minutes. As for me, I've been pretty busy lately. Obviously getting this episode ready to go, but some home improvement projects and even a bit of travel as my family and I took a nice long weekend vacation out to Chattanooga, Tennessee earlier this month to get out, explore it just a little bit north of us. And I guess it's a shameless plug for their tourism board, but go check out Chattanooga. It was a really great time. We had a blast and uh, tons of fun stuff to see and do for all ages. So definitely go check that out. And obviously, again, I've been recording this episode, but I've been busy doing a lot of coordination for the episodes coming up the rest of this year over the next couple months, and then some long range planning for next year as well, since man, we're already almost around the uh, holiday season again here in the US and a couple months away from the new year. So I'm really excited for what we have on the horizon. And I'm looking forward to what you guys uh, think of everything. So stay tuned. As for the show overall, we had a great response to the commemorative Air Force episode. And coincidentally enough, my guest Warren today actually supplied the hurricane and the Spitfire, as you'll hear in the interview that we're going to talk about for the uh, Wings Over Houston Air Show. And I wasn't aware he was doing this ahead of time as we had spoken back and forth in the coordination meetings. But man, it just goes to show you how tight the Warbird community is and how small a world this world has truly turned into. It's crazy. Well, as far as announcements for today, just a couple of them. First, our Patreon subscribers at the wingman level and uh, higher were treated to a live Zoom call with our recent F-35 episode guest, Billy, just the other day, and they were able to chat and interact with him. So if that's something you'd all like access to, then please go over to Patreon, sign up, and look for more of that great stuff in the future. I know we've got another happy hour just around the corner as well, so please take a look at it. We have a lot of fun doing it, and we hope you guys enjoy it as well. Also in ACE or Air Combat Experience Network news, our friends Bio and Crunch over at the F-14 Tomcast will be releasing episode four on Flying the Tomcat on October 26th. Man, I can't believe it's already been two months of that show on the air as well. Just how time flies, crazy. But hopefully everybody goes over and takes a listen, subscribes, and just listen to what they've got going on. They've got some really amazing stuff. It's really nitty gritty, in-depth details on things. And I know I'm learning a ton, so please go check it out if you have an interest in the Tomcat. Well, now we've got a great interview lined up this week, so we'll jump right into the listener questions and then right into the interview. So with that, our first question comes to us via email from Sage Reed, who asks, why is it that F-16Cs always carry AIM-120 AMRAMs on the wingtips instead of the AIM-9 like the F-A-18 does? To my knowledge, the F-16A carried AIM-9s on the wingtips, but then the F-16C got BVR capabilities and began carrying the AMRAM on the wingtips instead. I once read that it had something to do with aerodynamics, but I'm not quite sure. Well, Sage, thanks for your question. And it's not quite for aerodynamics as much as it is for structural integrity of the aircraft and longevity of the wing. There are some aerodynamic advantages for having a lighter missile on the wingtip, like the AIM-9, instead of the AMRAM. But the engineers determined that putting AIM-120s on the wingtips decreases the amount of wing flutter or torsion or warping or whatever label you want to put on it. But that wing experiences as it travels through the air. And so by putting the heavier missile on the wingtip, it will increase the overall lifespan of the wing and be more cost effective in the long run. And frankly, it just looks cooler, which is a lot of what this job is, right? But in all seriousness, we also don't fly with two AIM-9s. So that way, by putting AIM-120s on the wingtips, we keep a balanced load at the wingtip. And then we put one AIM-9 inboard on station two or eight, and then one AIM-120 on the opposite station. And so we go out with a three by one loadout. I think we've talked about this in air-to-air mission planning previously. But that's kind of the concept there. I'm not quite sure about the FA-18, why they only have AIM-9s. It could be a wiring system thing for the aircraft or something along those lines. We'll have to get Jello on here and hopefully he can give us an answer as to why the FA-18 is a little bit different. But at least for the F-16, that's the reasoning for that one. So great question. Thanks for asking. And our next submission is from Jeff Cole via voicemail. Hey guys, this is Jeff Cole, call sign Conehead, calling from Boise, Idaho. 
I just listened to the F-105 show and was really blown away by uh, Colonel Morrissey's story. I had a long email friendship with another F-105 pilot with two tours in Vietnam. His name was Ed Rasimus. And he's actually written three excellent books, two of them about the F-105. The first one's called When Thunder Rolled, and the second is called Palace Cobra. He also collaborated with Robin Olds, his daughter, in writing the biography of Robin Olds. Pretty good book. One of Ed's favorite stories about the F-105, you guys might get a kick out of this, is, of course, that was a single engine with an afterburner. Well, an afterburner is just a ramjet buckled on the back of a turbojet engine. And Ed claimed that if you took engine damage, as long as you got the burner lit, the main engine could completely fail. I think he meant even actually come to a stop. The burner would keep running and it could get you at least out of Indian country, but probably not home based on the fuel rates. Uh, Anyway, really enjoy the podcast. This episode in particular, as I say, great job, guys. Keep it up. Well, Jeff, I hadn't heard this, so I reached out to Colonel Morrissey, and to paraphrase his answer, the afterburner is not a ramjet. I mean, that's pretty true. But ramjets, as they were developed, required 300 knots of air and spark to continue ignition. And with the AB, it ignites when the jet begins to move, and it will quit if RPM slash power is reduced to the point where turbine fire slash heat can no longer ignite the JP4. And now you'd probably hear JP8, but that's the fuel type that they used at the time. And so in basic terms, if this type of engine quits or you turn it off, you turn off the thrust producing capability, the heat, and then there's no ramjet type thrust possible after that fact. So hopefully that clears that up. I am by no means an engine expert. And if anybody wants to chime in and correct me, as you guys are smart to do, then by all means, send those submissions in and we'll get that corrected on a future episode. But that's the way I understand it. And Colonel Morrissey was in agreement with me on that one. So hopefully that helps clear it up for you. And our final question this week comes from Peter Schmitz, who asks, in the Air Force, a student from UPT can be selected to do a FAPE tour or a first assignment instructor pilot tour. And so does that pilot get to choose what platform they fly after completing their FAPE tour, or are they at the needs of the Air Force? And additionally, does the Navy have something similar to this? So Peter, yes, not really at the same time, though, as years have gone by. The process has changed a bit. So we asked our F-16 guest T-Day about the FAPE program as he knew it when he was going through. And he said that you always have a preference as the one getting the assignment, i.e. you always ask for what you want via your preference list. But that's about as much as you can do. So previously, wing or ops group commanders were able to do swaps with other wing commanders from other training bases. And they'd push for certain airframes for certain pilots in line with their preferences and hopefully to get them what they want. But as time has gone on, it's kind of felt like the amount of influence those commanders have had over the process has started to decrease simply because of the perception of favoritism and a reduction in the overall quality and quantity of cockpits. But that being said, in this day and age that we live in right now, unfortunately, I think that perception is just not going to fly anymore. And that's for right or wrong. Everybody's got their own opinion on it. But ultimately, the needs of the Air Force are what are going to dictate what's available and what people will get. So just like undergraduate pilot training, UPT, And the aircraft drops that those students have when they finish their training programs, these FAPES or first assignment instructor pilots are kind of at the whim of what the Air Force has available at that moment. And so I know we've probably covered this at other points along the way, but timing is the big planning factor in in everything. And you just don't have control over it that way. So that covers the Air Force side. So I wanted to cover your other portion there with the Navy. And I spoke with Jello and he said the Navy did have an equivalent program to FAPE called SIRGRAD. S-E-R-G-R-A-D, or Selectively Retained Graduate, but he wasn't sure if it was still in effect. So I pulled our Facebook group, the FPP Pit, and you guys did not disappoint. So thank you for helping me out on this one. I had a couple of great responses. First was from Michael Ditzler, who posted that it is an active program and the selectee stays to instruct for maybe a three to five extra months after graduation, and that you'll most likely get your first choice upon completion. However, the needs of the Navy still trump the preference. And I don't know about the timeline. I'm not smart on that one. It seemed like it was pretty short for the amount of effort they were going to put in to make you an instructor, but the latter half of needs of the Navy still made a lot of sense on that one. Another great post we had was from Chuck Henry, and he said it's an option to select for post-graduation, but only for T-45s. So a little bit different there. You won't have anybody from T-6s, TH-57s, T-44, any of the instructors of those types that haven't already completed at least one fleet tour eligible for doing this program. So you too, thank you much for uh, helping me out with the answer on that one. And I think it was a great question, totally valid. And I think from the number of kinds of those types of questions we're starting to get, it sounds like we really need to get that Air Force pilot training episode spun up sooner rather than later. Man, we keep trying to fend you guys off of those questions, but we'll get something together in the near future. 
But to everybody that asked a question, thanks again for submitting. Keep them coming. We love them. But for now, we're going to jump into the interview with Warren and I will see you guys on the other side. So with that, let's roll it. Well, welcome everyone. We've turned back time yet again. And this time we're going to head across the Atlantic for our first British Warbird of our Warbird series. And with this being the pretty much the official anniversary, the end of the Battle of Britain, about 71 years ago this month, we're covering one of the heroes of that battle, the Hawker Hurricane. So to do that, we're turning to someone with years of experience in multiple Warbirds, amongst many other aircraft, Mr. Warren Peach. Warren, welcome to the show, sir. Hey, thanks, Trevor. It's great to be here. Well, I'm glad to have you here. It's uh, really exciting to have somebody that's got so much experience on their belt, and we will definitely get to that. You've flown, obviously, the Hawker Hurricane and a few others, so we'll hopefully get some comparisons between some of the aircraft you've flown. To start, I like to typically get a little bit of a background on you and where you're coming from. So let's go for it and find out where you're coming from. Where did you grow up? Where did you do your flight training? And how did you get your exposure to warbirds? Well, Troy, it's, it's great to be here and to have a chance to share some of the experiences I've been fortunate to have in my life. And uh, I'm in Minot, North Dakota. That's where I grew up. My dad's dad homesteaded here back in the early 1900s. And my dad was one of those kids affected by Lindbergh and grew up in the 30s and started a flying service. He came back from the Philippines from the Occupational Forces of World War II, and he came back and started uh, spraying and, and built up a flying service here that I grew up in. So I was very fortunate to spend my life at the airport. I'm not the director of the Dakota Territorial Museum. However, my dad, Al Peach, and Don Larson and myself were the three people that incorporated it in 1986. Basically, because we were collecting so much stuff at the flying service that people were bringing in, we felt that there must have been a tremendous amount of artifacts going to the junk ground. And if we had a collection point, maybe we'd be able to salvage some of that. And it turned out to be very successful for us. So the museum has grown into a very nice campus facility with 17 acres of outdoor displays and 55,000 square feet of indoor displays with about 50 to 60 airplanes ranging from the right flyer right up to an F-15 and, and lots of warbirds. As far as my flying goes, I sold it when I was 16 on my birthday and uh, flew charter for our family business and sprayed and uh, started building a little cliffwing T-craft to do aerobatics in when I was in high school and finished it when I was 20. And I still have that airplane. I still fly air shows in it. It's been 42 years now. I've been flying that airplane at air shows. And I flew for an airline for a while, did worldwide service, a lot of military stuff. And in 1992, I believe it was, Dad and I bought a TBM Avenger project. And with the help of Jerry Beck and Bob Odegaard, started working on it. And uh, my dad passed away in 95. Unfortunately, he never had a chance to fly it, but I finished that project in an L-29 and got involved in a P-40 with Beck and the zero and just kind of kept flying stuff. You know, when I was 10, I painted a picture of a P-51 on the wall of my bedroom and just started dreaming. And I'm one of them kids that was affected strongly by Bob Hoover watching him. And they say you put a picture of something on the fridge and eventually it'll get there. I kind of think a lot of that's true. You just keep it in your mind and you keep marching towards your goals. And because we live in such a phenomenal country and it gives you the opportunity to achieve your dreams. And that is certainly has been true for me. I've been very fortunate and in the process, got to fly a lot of different stuff, work on a lot of different stuff, but mostly meet some tremendous people. The airplanes originally were the goal for me. And after flying some warbirds, I started to understand that it was more about the people that, that built them, worked on them and flew them than it was actually the airplane. The airplane was just a vehicle to get to those people. So it's been pretty neat. That's quite the history, if you will, across a wide spectrum of different aviation platforms, obviously commercial flying. I'm assuming it was crop dusting is kind of what you were describing there from your father and, and the spring yep. and that kind of thing. Yeah. It, that's a wide variety of experience in aviation. And now to add on to it, the warbirds and the building and, you know, repairing and bringing them back to life after all their time. That's pretty awesome. I'm very impressed by where you've gotten yourself to, to say it gently, I guess, humble beginnings of just spraying fields with pesticides and everything like that. That's very awesome. I'm very impressed. I'm not the only guy that's done that. There's lots of people that don't, you just keep working. You know, I graduated high school. I never did go to college or anything. So I pretty much devoted my whole life to this type of flying. And it, I was very fortunate that it worked out the way it did. That's great. Well, Warren, one of the things we like to do is kind of start 
with the history of the aircraft that we're discussing. And so for the Hawker hurricane, you yourself fly one. And I think if I remember correctly, uh, a few weeks ago, we're recording this the middle of October, but you flew one down to Houston for the wings over Houston, uh, air show down there. Is that correct? It is correct. We took it down there. Bernie Vasquez flew it for that trip. I flew the Spitfire. We've been working on this hurricane with Ray Middleton from QG aviation for about the past six years. And we got it flying in June and I went down and test flew it and put some time on it in Fort Collins, Colorado, and then flew it home that same week. Uh, I took it to a fly in the, that weekend here in the state. And we put some time on it around home and did some practice. And then, then I had uh, Bernie came up and got qualified in it. And because of how Bernie and I worked together doing the formation work and the air show stuff, that became his ride for the summer. So he took it to Minneapolis and Oshkosh for that show and then on to Houston for the Houston show. And I flew the Spitfire for those shows. Oh, very so cool. I have flown the airplane a fair amount and did the test flying and I'm pretty familiar with it. But to be accurate about it, Bernie's the one that flew it to Houston and I flew on his wing with the Spitfire. Okay. Which very cool. Gave us a great comparison between the two airplanes. Yeah. I can imagine that's a, you know, one, a, a long way to go and flying those two airplanes yeah. next to each other. What does it take to get one of those airplanes from kind of just the cross country flying, if you will, since they are so old, is there anything unique that goes into the planning process? Bring tools, okay. and bring good mechanic and Bernie's a great mechanic. He's not just a good pilot or he's very familiar with the Merlin engines and you know, there's old hydraulic systems and old tires. We had a tail wheel issue on the way down ended up changing out a tail wheel tire and uh, the spitfire ended up having a flat and we got some stuff going there and you're you're always messing with stuff but uh, as far as the actual cross country from minot to houston probably the biggest challenge there is the short range of the airplanes we had five legs to get from minot to houston on last thursday is actually when we did it so just five legs four gas stops not a tremendous amount of range if you're going to land with a comfortable reserve of any kind. So, you know, that's probably one of the challenges. You're looking for favorable winds, not only in the air, but for your landing and takeoff sequences. You're hoping to not have a 80 knot crosswind when you get to where you're going. And sure. It seems like there's always, at some point in the trip, there's something that you're going to stop for and do some work on the airplane just to slow up an oil leak or do whatever. So. No, that's fair. I was yeah. trying to picture that in my mind, what that looks like. And in terms of range, how far are you able to uh, get the aircraft to go just in a normal cruise kind of speed? The hurricane is really short leg and our Spitfire fortunately has some uh, fuel tanks installed where there was ammo. So it's pretty decent. It's close to a Mustang. So 500 miles is doable, but Spitfires okay. is about a 350 mile point. Yeah. It's definitely it's, a different planning consideration. Yeah, it's interesting to read some of the history and stuff and see where they flew the airplanes off of carriers to Malta using slipper tanks and did these huge long-range trips in them. They obviously landed on fumes when they were getting the range out of them that they had. Yeah, we will get into that all of that good stuff, and I think that's a good segue into this aircraft. So it was initially flown 76 years ago this year in 1935, and it entered service with the uh, RAF in 1937. But in terms of the history, do you know, Warren, what the initial requirement for this aircraft was or, or how this aircraft filled that initial requirement? Yeah, you know, Trevor, I, I mean, I'll talk to that, but I'm sure that I'll say something that's not totally accurate. And I'd ask people to forgive me for that if I say something wrong. And there's so many great references online that you can look that stuff up on. But, you know, as I understand it, Sydney Cam was sop with and he were partners in World War One, and the uh, airplanes were called Sopwiths in World War One, and they decided to go with Hawker for these deals. Or Sidney Cam was the chief engineer for that company. I mean, Hawker and Sop were partners. But so Sidney Cam was working on a biplane fighter along with you know the things that they had before, and the the requirement came out from uh, the RAF to build a monoplane, and I think they adapted a lot of the things from their previous airplanes as far as the tubular bolted together fuselage construction you know the structure of the fuselage is just very world war one like when you look down the fuselage it's uh, big tubes that are bolted together at the junctions with flying wire braces in there and stuff and yeah. it's pretty interesting to compare that to other airplanes so i believe the requirement was to build a monoplane fighter with certain performance characteristics that they were looking for the 300 mile an hour and consequently the 
enclosed cockpit and retractable undercarriage. That sounds about yeah. what I understand it as well. They, I think they kind of took the Hawker Fury, which is one of the biplanes that you were discussing. They kind of retrofitted that in a sense to uh, strip that down, to make it a monoplane, reinforce the wing structure and, and everything else like that. So yeah, that about matches up with what I understood. And like you said, 300 miles an hour, eventually retractable gear. I think they started with fixed gear and they found out that didn't quite work. Didn't quite do what they wanted to do. Yeah. So let's go into the purpose of the aircraft. So the purpose of the aircraft was more of like an interceptor. Is that the way you understand it? Yeah, I, I would agree that everything that was built for England was designed with an interceptor thought process versus, and obviously not their bombers, but you know, even the Spitfire is a very limited range airplane. And when you talk to the veterans that flew them, uh, cross channel fights were almost impossible. By the time they reached the other side of the channel, they very rarely had enough gas to get back home yeah. to do it. So they were a up and down airplane and uh, just go up and shoot at what's coming at you that's coming across the coast and get back on the ground and refuel and do it again, rearm yep. and do it again. So yeah, that would be to me the definition of an interceptor. Get off quick, climb fast, shoot hard and land. There you go. The hurricane that you guys have at your uh, museum, which Mark variant is that one? It's a Canadian car and foundry airplane. So it's a Mark II, but they got redesignated depending on the engines and Okay. different things like that. This particular airplane was built in 1942 and remained in North America with the uh, RCAF. It didn't fly, interesting enough, until 1943 because of a shortage of radiators. And it was accepted and then parked until a radiator came for it. And that was assigned out to a coastal patrol squadron out in uh, Newfoundland, Okay, where it flew for you know a little over a year. 1944, it had an engine failure at low altitude, causing the pilot to put the airplane down in some uh, swampy area, and he walked away. It was kept on record for a long time, but it was considered substantially damaged and never really recovered for that reason. So it stayed there until, I think, 1971 or two when it was recovered and started the restoration process. Oh, fascinating. Well, I'm sure we will get into some of that. In terms of the other variants and everything, the first Mark I variant, the original, if you will, Hurricanes, they had fabric covered wings, just like all the you know traditional World War One airplanes that you uh, know and love. It had a two-bladed fixed pitch propeller, and it was the first one to use the Merlin engine, originally the Mark I and then the Mark II and III engines. Then it jumps into the Mark IIA version of the Hurricane itself. For your aircraft, what engine do you guys use on that one? Well, originally it had a Merlin three in it, and okay. which I believe is a 980 horse or 1,000 horse, something like that. We elected to make the engines in the Spitfire and the Hurricane the same just for operational, okay. you know, having parts and everything. So we have a 224 in each of the engines, which is a single-stage, two-speed blower Merlin that's considerably higher horsepower yep. than what it had originally. And we've talked quite a bit about the performance of this airplane in comparison to Spitfire and how it's surprised us as much as it has in how well it performs. And I think a lot of that probably has to do with the fact that we're running more horsepower. Uh, I can't imagine the airplane with a fixed pitch two blade wood prop in a, in a lower horsepower engine was probably kind of a dog. I would think. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, was, I would. Uh, I would yeah. agree. All the history books and everything, you know, there's not too many of those uh, Mark One configurations that are out there for sure. I didn't even, frankly, know that they made any with a two bladed fixed pitch propeller. And yeah. I think they realized that pretty early on in its development. So they switched right. to the three bladed and, and the uh, constant speed prop yep. to help, uh, to yeah. help overcome that stuff. And the Spitfire went through the same trials. You know, it started out with a two blade wood prop and then they went to a two position propeller. Mm -hmm. you know, or shifted and stuff. And the, it's just development of power plants and propellers that made all these airplanes get better throughout the war. I think, you know, you mentioned that the original Hurricanes had fabric covered wings and talking to Ray Middleton, they actually flew Hurricanes that had one metal wing and one fabric covered wing. They were interchangeable, just had different skinning on them as they were coming down the production line and they were shifting over. Uh, if somebody needed spares for something or something, I guess it was certainly a possibility that they would send out a, or they would put a fabric wing on an airplane that had a metal wing on the other side. Yeah. It's kind of like the concept of you guys yeah. using the same engine in both airplanes for operational right. ease. Yeah. So yeah, for sure. That makes a lot of sense. 
Have you run across anybody that ever flew one of the sea hurricanes, the modified off the uh, merchant aircraft carriers by chance? I have not. I did a lot of reading though about the Malta stuff and the different things, but I have never talked to anybody that actually flew one. Okay. Yeah. And just for the listeners out there, if you're not familiar, so they took a regular hurricane, whatever that exactly means, because there are multiple variants as we've kind of discussed, but they took one and made it basically a carrier capable version that would launch off these merchant aircraft carriers that the Brits devised as another way to be able to launch platforms or launch aircraft off of mobile platforms in addition to the traditional aircraft carrier concept. So ton of amazing history behind this airplane specifically. And then when you add on the Spitfire and the complimentary view, if you will, of the two aircraft, quite an interesting story. My records, there were over 14,400 total hurricanes produced. Is that about what you know? Yeah, or? that's what I've read and heard, I guess. you know. Interesting thing on the sea hurricanes is their recovery. I think it's uh, amazing to think that the guy sitting there knows that when he's all done fighting, he's going to ditch the airplane, that that's his only option. <laughs> kind of of a scary concept (laughs) it is yeah (laughs) yeah and then just for those uh, that are following along the nickname of those not a hurricane it's hurricats apparently as well so yeah very interesting uh catapult launched they had to conform to the fleet air arm so they had to put different radios in there to conform to their standards and they used instead of miles per hour they used knots and that is now obviously the standard across the uh, spectrum but at the time i guess that was a, a unique thing as well well, shoot, let's see here. What else can we talk about with the variants of the aircraft? Anything that you've run across, Warren, that's unique to any of the specific variants? You know, and maybe not on that same subject, but something that I think was interesting for us to note was if you've been around a hurricane, they're a large airplane. They almost dwarf a Spitfire when they stand there. They got a real bulldog stance to them and stuff. And the wing is extremely thick at the wing root, which I wonder, I kind of think, as they were transitioning from biplanes to a monoplane, there was probably some concern about strength. You know, I wonder if that's what they were looking at or whatever, but you know, the oil tank is in the wing road to the left wing. And uh, and then there's a gas tank in each wing and one ahead of the cockpit. And they're just a real transitional airplane. I fly a lot of vintage airplanes and I enjoy that era a lot. And it's really neat to be around the thing that way. As far as flying different variants, this is the only hurricane I've been around. It's certainly the only hurricane that I've ever even seen out of a museum flying. So I can't talk real smart about the other airplanes at all. You can go through the list and look it up on Wikipedia and find all kinds of fancy facts and and all that kind of stuff. But the tank busters would have been interesting. That's for sure. I love the British terminology when they talk about unrifled projectiles you know what the rest of us call a rock uh, but <laughs> <That's> they, <right. laughs> they have you some unique terminology when they talk about things and uh, but the airplane was certainly probably about as versatile as any single engine fighter in world war ii i mean it was put into a lot of different roles throughout the war with a lot of different air arms you know between russia and france and england and everybody else flying them and being down in north africa fighting tanks and being in the Battle of Britain, fighting bombers and fighters. It did a lot of stuff. Oh, yeah. I think that's a great transition point to talking about the different roles that the aircraft did fly. We touched on the naval version and launching off of the modified ships, basically. You talked about the tank busting, the air-to-ground versions. There was the intercept type of mission-capable you know, initial concept of what it was designed to do. Anything else that was uh, unique about any of the mission sets that it was asked to fill? Yeah, I don't know about that. I, I guess I can't think of anything offhand anymore than that. It seems a pretty wide variety to be fighting with Rommel in the desert and fighting with the reconnaissance airplanes that were fighting our convoys out in the middle of the ocean and fighting the Battle of France and the Battle of Britain and at the same time over in Russia. I mean, they were already in Russia in '41 fighting that war it's uh you know i've always been a fan of i mentioned i'm kind of a vintage airplane guy and and certainly flying a p-51 and a, and a corsair and all these beautiful airplanes is an honor but i've been a fan of the p-40 and the wildcat and the hurricane because i always joked that those were the airplanes that hung on while the pretty girls were getting designed <laughs> and uh i really enjoy the fact the hurricane when i was a teenager and reading all my bantam books and all the other stuff a hurricane kind of got poo-pooed a lot. It was always about the Spitfire. And flying this airplane has really vindicated that thought process now for me because 
in that whole thing, you know, you always had the hurricane side versus the Spitfire side. And I think there was a, a British fighter pilot that said, and I can't remember the exact quote, but he basically said we needed them both. It was the pair that made it work. There's people that are staunch hurricane people and there's people that are staunch Spitfire people. And I respect them both. The more I'm around the hurricane, the more I like the looks of it. I just think it's a cool looking airplane and it doesn't fly the same as a Spitfire, but it does some things better than the Spitfire. Yeah. For sure. Well, on our podcast, we have some contributors via uh, Patreon that are afforded the opportunity to ask some questions of our guests during the episodes. So the first question that we have from one of our listeners is from Michael. And his question is, why was the hurricane used primarily to attack bombers in the Battle of Britain, i.e. less dogfighting? And I think you kind of touched on a little bit of it there. Spitfire took care of the fighters, if you will. And the hurricane was kind of left to go after the bombers during the Battle of Britain. Is that what you know of that history? It is. And I have a couple of opinions and they're exactly that. I can't say that they're factual or anything else, but after flying the two airplanes, the hurricane definitely has a higher lift wing and it does not climb the Spitfire, which makes it a little bit better interceptor. But in a diving scenario, the Spitfire definitely outdives the hurricane. So I could see where that would be an advantage when you were fighting other fighters that you'd want to have that speed range in that environment. So I think the Spitfire would be a little bit better there. And the other thing that I've noticed in doing aerobatics is that in a typical high lift wing reaction, the roll rate really diminishes under negative G in a hurricane where the roll rate maintains a little better in the Spitfire in negative G. So if you're fighting where, you know, the bomber's not going to roll upside down where you need to follow and do that, you don't really need that maneuverability. But if you're fighting a 109 or a 190, that would become more important. You know, I think the Spitfire probably had a little better advantage in that realm. That seems like that would make sense as well. And and they did talk about that in some of the history books when it came to the camber of the wing. Like you said, it's a thicker wing. Again, back to the engineering of transitioning from biplanes to monoplanes. I think that obviously plays into all of that stuff. And as they did more and more testing, not that they had the wind tunnels of today, but as they're able to identify the strengths and weaknesses of wing design. So you see that advancement in the Spitfire and the associated positives and negatives with a a thinner wing or a smaller cambered wing there. So very good. All right. Well, Warren, so let's talk about what the aircraft did carry in combat and what ordinance it had attached to it. So it's obviously World War II era, primarily a guns only type of uh, system when it comes to air to air capability. But you mentioned something about some rockets on the aircraft as well. Well, just in a little bit of reading I've done, uh, they talked about all the different things that the airplane would do, you know, and originally it came up with a, a whole bunch of 303s in it, which I don't think the 303 or 7.7 millimeter bullet was probably extremely destructive for a lot of the things they were doing. So I'm sure they were looking for different types of things to use to either shoot down bombers or blow up tanks or whatever. But, you know, the missiles or rockets or whatever, I think the British, they called them uh, unrifled projectiles, which is a typical British way to say something a little harder than normal, I guess. I don't know. But uh, (laughs) so I'm sure that was an interesting airplane. I think they had like three on each side or I'm sure they had different variants. You know, I think so many of these airplanes, they have so many different, designations to the airplanes and, and an awful lot of it was just they were just building whatever they had to build for that particular period of the war to make something work so i mean Got missiles it. bombs rockets cannons the airplane had a lot of different stuff on it i saw a picture of it with drop tanks on it which would really be handy for us if we yeah. had hard points you know for travel around the u.s but yeah they certainly had a lot of different ordnance on them Yeah. They were kind of a uh, choose your own adventure when it came to armament, you know, based on the variants and then based on the mission task at hand. And it does seem like there was a a fair amount of just put it on there and let's hope for the best kind of thing. Cause there wasn't a lot of time to do, you know, the standard testing and evaluation that we're used to these days where you have 10 to 15, 20 years, whatever it is of evaluation of an aircraft before it comes operational. So necessity drives a lot of change for sure. And then you did mention the air to surface weaponry. So, uh, 250 pound or 500 pound bombs on some of the later models of the aircraft as well. And the drop tanks, uh, similar to the P 51 and having uh, the ability to extend its range with drop tanks there. So that's great. Uh, let's talk about where this aircraft was located. You touched on, uh, obviously the British, the Canadian variants, where else do you know the aircraft was flown? They were in Russia real early in in Murmansk or someplace, and they had French and U.S. and Russian and English pilots all flying them. 
over there, which is pretty amazing uh, when you consider the political world before World War II and the beginning of it. And then for us to be under that quick with stuff. And I think they use a lot of hurricanes. And as a matter of fact, I think a lot of the current hurricane restorations out there are there are places that have been recovered from Russia and brought out and stuff. So I don't know how many different countries operated the airplane or how many different nationalities flew it, but it's a bunch. And yeah. you know, when you just look at the Commonwealth countries of New Zealand and in Australia and Canada and the British empire was pretty big. And so everybody flew everything. So it was pretty amazing. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. I, you know, my research team did their due diligence and it says in all, there were 24 variants of the Hawker hurricane created with around uh, 14,483 aircraft built in total. 3000 of those via the lend lease program went to uh, Russia and they were able to do their uh, basic licensed construction of aircraft and then amongst all the rest of the Commonwealth stuff. But yeah, you're absolutely right. The British Empire at the time was very expansive everywhere yep. around the world. So that's a really good point that I think maybe get overlooked a little bit. Given- and 3,000 airplanes. Think about that. You know, just the one, that's a lot of airplanes, 3,000 airplanes. And I don't know when the storm of it was designed, but boy, when you look at the wing in the center section of a hurricane and compare those two airplanes, it's amazing how... It is almost like they came from the same family in some ways, but I know like when they sent the aircraft over initially to Canada for production and they kind of saw the storm brewing in Britain and they needed some more manufacturing capability, you know, they send over all the plans obviously to build their aircraft. Then they send over a couple of, you know, example aircraft as well so that they know exactly what they're doing and what it should look like when it's all said and done. And I'm sure that was something similar for the Russians and, and everyone else that was uh, allowed to yeah. license produce uh, these aircraft as well. So fascinating how the, all this stuff kind of works and the politics and everything, like you mentioned of the time versus I think what everybody has fresh in their mind today and and the adversarial relationship that kind of exists these days. It's just a very different world, but uh, very fascinating how this kind of gets produced over time. So on the uh, ordinance front, John Clark had discussed about the uh, gunned up or the upgunned Hurricane Mark II C, and we covered the uh, respective ground attack and tank busting missions with the uh, gondola style pods, as you mentioned, or the rockets, for lack of a better way to put it. So we'll move into, uh, I guess, strengths and weaknesses. And you have the advantage of having flown both the Hurricane and the Spitfire. And I know we have a bunch of questions on which is better. So I'll leave that one for the very end. You can kind of you know, mull that over in the back of your mind as we go through the rest of these questions. But with respect to the Hurricane specifically, what is your favorite feature, I guess, of the Hurricane as you've flown it? Hmm. <laughs> it's a super honest airplane. I'm probably about as weird as anybody is out there about old airplanes because the stuff that a lot of people complain about interests me because I look at it and go, wow, this is the way they thought this should be done at that time. And for the time, it was probably a great idea. The uh, cockpit is comfortable. I don't think it's terribly laid out. It's typical British where when you take off the throttles on the left, so you're taking off with your throttle on the left hand and you're sticking the right, and then you have to transition over to stick in the left and go to the gear and flap console to do whatever you're going to do over there. And the gear flap console in the Hurricane is like a Hurst shifter. It's an H pattern. Up and left is gear up, and down and left is gear down. And when you finish either one of those cycles, you have to go back to neutral in the middle. Flaps are up and right is up and down and right is down. And then when you go to retract the gear, there's a select versus safe switch that you want to get out of the way because it won't let you inadvertently retract the gear because obviously the flaps are right there too. Yeah. Doing that, you know, there's a little bit of thinking as you're doing that stuff, but I look at that and I go, is that a detriment? Not to me. It's, I think it's cool. (laughs) It's just kind of a neat thing that they put all the hydraulics in that one spot and made it work uh, for, lack of a better description there's interesting things done in the airplane that i wouldn't do but they're neat to look at the door for the radiator has a handle by the left side of the seat that you put up and down and you can tell where the door is by the position of the handle and yet they put an indicator in so that you can watch the indicator move too so they went through all the monkey motion of putting a cable up there and an indicator and and that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, as far as the favorite things on the airplane, the visibility is great. It doesn't have a header tank like a Spitfire or a Mustang. So the nose really tapers away from you. You can see over the nose really good on the ground and in the air. 
the canopy is super easy to use. It doesn't look like it would be great, but it's got pretty good visibility. You know, there's bars, you know, like any old canopy. The ground handling characteristics are real nice. It is, you know, a pneumatic brake airplane with a rudder bar versus rudder pedals and toe brakes. So you squeeze a trigger on the spade to administer some air to the brake system, and then you select where that air goes by where you position the rudder bar. Okay. Uh, I do like the English stick configuration where the stick goes back and forth for elevators and then hinges three quarters of the way up the stick and goes back and forth with the uh, top of the stick in the round, the you know, or oval spade handle. You don't have to move your legs around any to move the stick. All of the aileron function is above your knees for most people. For me, I'm still, I'm tall enough that I still have a little interference, but not bad. Okay. I typically sit real high in the cockpits to give myself some leg room in there, like in the zero and the spit and stuff. It's about the only way I can get in and and not be all crumpled up in there. So <laughs> I raise the seat up to give myself some leg room. But Do you know about what size the seat or the cockpit was designed for uh, in terms of like a, a height? You know, I've always heard that the typical, the average pilot from World War II was like 5'6 to 5'8". Okay. And 140 to 160 pounds. Okay. And that makes sense from the people that I met over the time. You know, we've all gotten bigger over the years. You know, that's probably what they were designed for. I'm not uncomfortable in either one of them. I don't feel uncomfortable in the airplane. There's just not a lot of options of where I'm going to sit. Yeah, fair. Uh, it's a good airplane. It's honest. It's really honest and it's nice on the ground. And when it comes to cool. the learning how to fly it, obviously you didn't learn how to fly in this aircraft. Did you have a lot of tail dragger time prior to flying it? Yeah. I, you know, I kind of grew up around tail wheels with agricultural airplanes and cubs and rear ones and everything else. And so I had quite a bit of tail wheel time. And then the, my Warbird experience has been TBM, P40, P51, Corsair, Zero, I have flown a lot of different airplanes. And one of the things I think that really helped with the pneumatic brake system is I had that Russian L-29 for a while, and okay. they have the same brake system. That's a little bit of a bugaboo for some people. If somebody was going to go fly this airplane or a Spitfire and they had never used the pneumatic brakes with a trigger on the handle, I would almost suggest that they go get a yak or something and fly something that had that brake system just to get used to the application. One of the things that, that happens with the brakes is – if you picture yourself taxiing straight ahead and you want to slow down, the brake pedals or your rudder bar is centered and you squeeze the bicycle handle type brake handle that's on the spade. You know, the spade is that oval thing on the top of the stick. As you yep. squeeze that in the cockpit, there's a couple of needles that show you how much pressure you're applying to the brakes. And you'll see both of those come up and the airplane will, will stop or slow or whatever you want to do. Now, if you want to use left brake, you do that same thing with the left rudder bar depressed and the right one back and all that pressure goes to the left brake. I'll cause you to go left, obviously. So same thing coming right. But what does happen is if you try to be really smooth with it and you don't move the handle, the brake handle, and you come from full deflection brake one direction or the other back through the center. Yeah. Instead of taking the pressure that you applied to the one side and dividing it in half and putting it to the other side, it doubles your braking. It's very possible that you can put the airplane up on its nose. When you start changing things, you kind of want to let off the brakes and use kind of a pulsating motion for actuating the brakes until you get used to them. And I can see where that might be a little bit of a, a checkout. I, when I check guys out in the airplane, that's one of the things we go over pretty thoroughly before we turn them loose. Yeah, that seems like a smart move. Well, so in terms of learning how to fly the aircraft itself, you had a bunch of experience behind you before you ever got to it. But could you put yourself in the shoes of somebody, you know, new coming into the aircraft for the first time, either whether it was, you know, back in the time of when it was in active service or even now as you've taught people and checked people out and give an impression on how easy it is to learn how to taxi and then fly and land and everything like that? Well, you know, going back to the beginning of World War II, everybody that flew airplanes at that time was very low time, obviously, that by the time they got to this thing. and But they had been flying conventional gear airplanes, tailwheel airplanes. So that part wasn't that new to them. 
the systems, and I think the military does a good job and always has in training people with systems. You know, I read the hurricane book a few times before I got in it and found virtually no valuable information in it whatsoever. Uh, but <laughs> it was, Classic. But it was there and it was this little book and it was pretty easy reading and it was funny. And, but as far as, you know, operating the airplane, they, they operated off of grass, which makes everything way easier in that type of airplane. Is it a little a, more forgiving in that respect? Yeah, grass is way more forgiving in any airplane. I mean, you know, it's just easier on tires and everything. If you've got yeah. a smooth grass airport, that's really the optimum which we very rarely have anymore. Uh, when I flew it out of Fort Collins, uh, we tried to do it early in the morning and late in the evening because it was 100 degrees when I was down there and, and there was fires going on. The visibility was way down and stuff, but I was operating off of pavement there, obviously, on a hot day. My major consideration initially when I got in the airplane was cooling. I felt, and especially from the Spitfire experience that in the P-40 experience, that this was going to be an issue to cool. The airplane, this one cools great. The radiators work great and stuff, but... Well, when I got in it, I got in it with the idea that, well, I got a taxi a half mile the other end of the airport. It's 96 degrees, and I'm not going to be able to dally. I'm not going to be able to get down there and think about a whole bunch of stuff. So I need to sit in here and rehearse this whole flight and have everything how it's going to happen. First, even though I've never flown the airplane before, I need to have a plan for what's going to happen as I go test fly it. So, yeah. and that's what I did. And it, you know, I had some speeds in my head where I thought and some attitudes where I thought it should come off the ground and how long I was going to wait before I put the gear up in case it did quit or something and, and different things. It has a very low gear speed, 102 mile an hour gear speed. So you, that's another thing you can't spend a whole lot of time out there because if you below a gear speed at a high power setting, that means you're climbing like a banshee and it's probably going to get warm. So you need to go ahead and get that transition done, get the gear up and get the airplane clean and get it breathing good. So that everybody's happy, you know, so the radiator's happy and, was going on so the first time i fly an airplane i'm not romanticizing about his history i'm flying an airplane i'm doing a job and i'm not thinking about the fact that some young 18 year old canadian or brit was sitting in this thing fighting for his life i do that at a later date i do that when i know everything's running good and i'm at altitude and i'm going cross country now i can sit back and go wow this is amazing that i've had a chance to fly this airplane that somebody fought for their life in but the first flight is to always try to be highly aware of what's going on, try to be as educated as possible about everything in the airplane, try to have rehearsed where everything's at in the airplane so that it's not a you're not fumbling around looking for stuff and and then just go out and fly it. See what happens. Yeah. And how's the ease of landing? Hard, easy, and the visibility you said was good, you know, while you're flying yeah, around was, out the cockpit and stuff, but how's that yeah, over the nose? I, it's really a straightforward deal with our plane. It goes on the ground nice, slow. You fly final at 80, 90 miles an hour. You know, like when I take off the first time, I try to take off in a what I would call a almost three-point attitude. I get the weight off the tailwheel, but I try to keep the tailwheel close to the ground for the rotation so I can see what that speed's going to be for the touchdown. You know, it breaks ground at 60 miles an hour. And straight ahead stall when I up, when I up did the stall series, it stalled at 60 straight ahead, and but that's power off. And, uh, and on a 2G turn, it stalled at 74. So that's pretty slow. Yeah. When you get on the ground, you don't have a big, long rollout or anything like that. So. Gotcha. Yeah, it's got to be an impressive feeling. Once you do have that second to think about it, and you're not uh, concerned about whether it's going to fly or not, yeah. but definitely an impressive thing to be cruising around at. Well, so let's flip that question that I asked earlier around. So instead of favorite features, what are the biggest annoyances or things beyond all the modern conveniences of GPS and all that kind of stuff? But what are some of the things that you wish that it did have, or, you know, you could fix? It's you miserably hot in the cockpit. <laughs> when you take off and start climbing, there's air coming through the wheel wells and it's comfortable. Yeah. And as soon as you level off the radiator pressurizes the cockpit from the radiator and it's literally like 140 degrees in the cockpit. You can barely touch anything in there, like piping or tubing or anything. It's just miserable. Hot. Wow. It's got two little air vents, holes up by the windshield that are supposedly supposed to be air, but nothing comes in them. So uh, you ever see those blue Phillips oil nozzles that come with Phillips oil? Uh -huh. Maybe in a plastic, they're kind of a 90 degree thing. Yeah. 
I grabbed a couple of them and stuck them in them holes, and I got some air in the cockpit so I could cool <laughs> off because it is hot. There you but, go. There's uh, a modification yeah, right there. Yeah. That's yeah. Great. The canopy is good. It doesn't have a latch. It's kind of different that way. It actually has a latch to hold it back instead of forward because if you pull it back and you don't latch it back, it just flies forward again. So that's kind of cool. Oh, wow. As far as other things in a cockpit, I kind of talked about how it's, you know, typical older design. You're switching hands and during takeoff and the prop controls kind of hit up underneath the combing and everything's not on a quadrant. You got to search around a little for some of that stuff if you don't know exactly where it's at. And, you know, we're flying different airplanes all the time. So sometimes it would be nice if everything was the same and it just isn't the same. Sometimes the mixture's where the prop control is on the other airplane and vice versa, or it's in a whole different place. And that's the remarkable thing about a P-51 is a Mustang is like a modern airplane. Everything is laid out so nice in the cockpit and it works so good. These early airplanes aren't like that. Didn't they started out without a constant maybe. battery. They started out with a fixed pitch prop. And then when they added a constant speed, they had to add a lever in there someplace to adjust it. Yeah, so they just okay. found a place to put it. That would be the only thing that I would say in the airplane that would really be you know, and that's part of the interest of the airplane. If it's an old airplane, if you want to fly a airplane that doesn't have some annoyances, then you should go get in a new airplane. That's fair. Or pay a lot of money to retrofit, I guess. And that's going to don't do that to that old airplane. Leave no. it old. <laughs> <laughs> it's not worth it, but that's the only other no. solution yeah. for that. that exactly. Problem. So let's jump into a little bit of that comparison question that I think was my most asked coming into this episode. And the first person that asked it, not exactly that way, but the difference between the hurricane and the Spitfire. Greg Lund wanted to know kind of what the fundamental difference between the two aircraft is. And from your perspective, what is that? Or can you identify that? Well, it starts out getting in the airplane. The hurricane sits up so high that you need a stirrup and a step to get in. So you pull the step down out of the bottom of the fuselage. When it comes down, it it pulls a door up out of the way for the handhold that's up above the step. And that step is shaped, it looks like a stirrup from a horse, which is well, kind of funny. I think it's, it's just another deal of how the cavalry was transitioning from horses to airplanes, it seems sure. like. But So you step in that thing and you step up on the wing and it's kind of a climb to get up in the cockpit. Once you're up on the wing, you push that little door down and it retracts the step for you. And then there's another step on the side of the fuselage and you step up over the combing and and down in the cockpit, step on the seat and slide in where the Spitfire sits right down next to the ground. You just walk up, step on the wing, and there's a door on the side. And you step on the seat and slide in and close the door, and you're in there. And it shows the difference in not just design, but size in the airplanes as you're getting in there. It's like a whole different mindset when you're walking up the airplane. It's like, oh, this is pretty civilized, and this one here is a big brute is when you're getting <laughs> in the airplane. But it's uh, a little more refined, so, something like yeah. that. The companies had different ways of gear up and down indications. I think Hawker had a better system than Supermarine did have. You know, Hawker has their up indications and gear down indications have redundancy in them without changing bulbs. But the Spitfire, if you burn out a bulb, you actually take the display apart and replace the bulb to see what's going on with the gear. Um their hydraulic actuated gears with squat switches and the wheel wells. So you need to be sure when you're retracting the gear that they do come up because sometimes they don't get all the way in the wheel well and you want to make sure that happens before you go too far and get too fast. Okay. The Spitfire has a very narrow gear. The Hawker is the Hurricane is a much wider stance and it would appear to be a easier airplane to operate on the ground. Although both of them steer remarkable. Neither one of them have a steerable tailwheel or a locking tailwheel. And both of them steer with the rudder. If you're going five miles an hour, you don't hardly need brake for steering, oh, which wow. is amazing. That geometry that they've got figured out on both airplanes. But the Spitfire, when you're taxiing that airplane, you know, it's hard to see out of you're sitting down low. The nose is way up in front of you there. And that, so you're S turning all the time. The hurricane, you don't have to S turn very much. The Spitfire and narrow gear, oh. it seems like it would be a detriment. But it's actually pretty dang nice. It steers nice on the ground. It handles nice. And if you're in a strong crosswind, for anybody that's flown a glider with just a single wheel in the middle, you know how easy it is to hold the wing down in that situation. And that's kind of the way a Spitfire is. Where the Hurricane, if one of the mains touches down, the other one's going to be on the ground shortly, no matter what you do, because it's got such a wide stance. But the Spitfire, you can actually touch down on one wheel with the wing down and go down the runway on one wheel quite a ways before... 
the speed bleeds off enough for the other wheel to touch. When you get airborne, uh, we talked about the gear a little bit and how you're transitioning over your right hand with both of them and the different indications. You get airborne, the visibility out of the Hurricane is better in the climb, and the Hurricane outclimbs the Spitfire. Ours does. The way they're both configured right now, the Hurricane is has a substantially better climb rate in the 160 mile an hour regime. When we're leveled off in these two airplanes at like, say, 9,500 feet, they're amazingly close in speed and fuel burn. Spitfire burns about 10% less fuel for the same speed as the Hurricane, but they both go cross country at 220 mile an hour indicated real easily. When you put the nose down on the two airplanes, now the Spitfire out accelerates the hurricane fairly well. Okay. The Spitfire has much nicer ailerons, but the hurricanes are, they're okay. Back to the controls on the Spitfire versus hurricane. The Spitfire tail is extremely light, almost twitchy. And the ailerons are very nice. They're a little heavier than the tail forces. The hurricane's a little more balanced that way in that the tail isn't as twitchy, but the ailerons aren't as good as the Spitfire's. Just in like responsiveness to in control inputs? Yeah, responsiveness and pressures both. Okay. Harder to slow the Spitfire down, but it has a higher gear speed. So it ends up being about the same challenge in both airplanes. That's about it. No, that's good yeah. synopsis, good comparison. The cooling difference, Trevor, is huge. The Hurricane really cools well and the Spitfire does not. When you put the gear down in the Spitfire, the gear legs go in front of the radiators. Okay. And when Watch you put the flow. flaps down, the flaps seal off the back of the radiators. Okay. And so when you're Traps in a pattern, in you know, in cruise, it's okay. But All right. So Warren, after all of that, what is your favorite memory of flying the hurricane? Last weekend at Houston, I wasn't actually flying. I was in the Spitfire, but the snowbirds were there. And uh, I'm fortunate to have been associated with the snowbirds since the beginning of the snowbird team in 1970, my dad knew the first coordinators of it and stuff. So we went and talked to the snowbirds. They have a deal at the end of their show called the battle of Britain break yeah. where they line all the airplanes up in a, in trail. And then they swirl around. And it looks like, you remember the scene at the end of the movie, the battle of Britain uh-huh. with all the contrails in the sky. Yeah. So they kind of reenact that with their smoke trails. Oh, cool. And they allowed us to, uh, coordinate with them so that we were at show center in formation with the hurricane and the spitfire while that was happening behind us. Oh, amazing. And, uh, it was really cool so far. That's probably the best memory. That's very, very cool. Now on the flip side of that, what is the scariest thing you've ever found yourself in, in the hurricane? I don't know that I would say I, I haven't really been scared in the airplane. I haven't been worried. I've been attentive nervous i mean that's just part of test flying the airplane and looking at stuff when i first started flying aerobatics in it i guess maybe the thing that got me the attention the most was when i learned that the ailerons didn't work very good upside down i pulled up (laughs) and did a cuban eight and i coming across the top i unloaded it to about a half a positive g and it didn't want to roll and i was like oh well that's interesting you know i loaded it back up and rolled out and i ended up about 20 degrees off heading and (laughs) and noted that that that's how it behaves and altered the way i flew it from then on you know i really haven't had anything remarkable happen in it okay well that's probably a good way overall to be i would say yeah as far as uh, your personal bests, if you will, it's got a service ceiling of about 36,000 feet, but what's the highest that you've taken it and how did it feel to fly? We don't go very high with our airplanes. It has an oxygen system in it, but we're always 10,000 or under okay. when we're flying the airplanes. Yeah, and it's fine. It flies great there, but you know, it's so hard to get the oxygen system serviced when you're going cross country. We kind of save it for when we need it. If we need it to go to 15, it's nice to have it there. Otherwise, we just kind of hang on to it when we might need it. And so, you said you guys cruise around about 220 indicated. Is that right? Yep. Is that about yep. as fast as you guys ever take it? As far as going cross country, you mean? Or as or far as in general? Well, what, air show, no, we see 300 indicated all the time. Yeah. When we get in waved airspace and we're practicing, I have a practice box out of my house where we do our practice. And then, and then when you get an air show deal where you can go fast under 10,000, then we push her up and let her rip. They're fun up there. You get them up to that. The vertical maneuvers are big. You got lots of time to look around and see what's going on and take your time and run the trim a little bit so you don't get tired pulling. It's fun when you're going fast. That's great. 
All right. Well, I have two more questions. The first is uh, the celebrity of the aircraft. And obviously everybody knows Battle of Britain, the actual event. And you already mentioned the movie Battle of Britain. Is there anywhere else that you know of that the Spitfire or the uh, hurricane, excuse me, was, uh, I guess, highlighted at all in any film or book or anything like that that you would recommend? Well, lots of books. You know, I love the, I don't know if you've ever heard of Robert Stanford Tuck, but he had a book, I think called Fly for Your Life. And he got some hurricane stories in there that are great. The opening scene of the Battle of Britain, I think, has probably got to be one of the greatest hurricane movie pieces that a guy could see because they've got them sitting there running and taking off. And uh, the sound of a hurricane, if you go watch that movie, it sounds like they don't sound correct. But the Hurricane has a different exhaust system than a Mustang or a Spitfire. It has that kind of almost like a radial engine collector exhaust system where the yeah. two cylinders go into a stack and then that uh-huh. stack is interconnected with the next one yeah. and interconnected again. They sound like a turbine almost when they're running. One of the things we do in our air shows, we make a pass with spacing between the Hurricane and the Spitfire so that you can hear the difference in sound, even though they're the same engines. That movie, The Battle of Britain, you hear it in there when they're running. That's kind of neat. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Well, to pull that at the end of each of our episodes, we uh, try to do like a flyby of the aircraft that we've just spoke about. We'll see if we can find one of those audio clips and throw that in at the end for the listeners out there. All right. Well, those are good places to find the aircraft. And then uh, my last question for you, Warren, is so which is better? And this is the most asked question, the Hurricane or the Spitfire. What do you prefer? The one I'm sitting in. <laughs> good answer good answer <laughs> you never talk answer. bad about the girl that took you to the dance right that's, <laughs> that's a great answer that's a really good <laughs> answer yeah. they, yep, i would they agree both got their strong points and i think they're both phenomenal points i really do and they're they're just different that's all well very good no that's a great answer i appreciate that honesty and and uh i think that's 100 percent correct so Well, you've been a great sport throughout today's discussion. So Warren, thank you so much for uh, joining us today as a fadeaway. Is there anything else that you can think of that popped into your mind about the hurricane that you want to have the listeners know about? Not right now. I don't. Hopefully you can come and and look at them when they're sitting side by side in the museum up here in Minot. It's a heck of an honor for us to be able to have those airplanes on display. We did take them to Lone Star Museum in Houston for the winter. So you can go see them there at Lone Star this winter they're on loan down there so uh if anybody's in the houston area they're at ellington field at lone star and uh our museum here in minot the dakota territory air museum is uh the website's there there's lots of stuff on there about the airplanes too and uh sure hope to see you at an air show someplace where you can see the airplanes operate you led me right into the next segment here which is you know helping to to get the word out about your museum so the dakota territory air museum.com is the website that everybody can go to and check it out you guys are located in minot north dakota so it's you know a little further north than the uh, the traditional places that we uh, would normally visit i would say but are you guys right next to the air force base up there we are at the minot international airport on the north side of it which is about 10 miles from the air base Okay. Um, All right. So everybody can fly in in the morning, go see the museum, yeah. and then it can take off in the afternoon if they want to. That's great. Remember, we're not north of everybody. We're south of Canada. That is true. You are centrally located <laughs> in, in North America, I guess. So there that's, you go. that's a valid point. <laughs> I know you guys, you said for the winter. So are you guys open uh, year round or are you guys kind of special and unique in that way? Our museum here in Minot has normal operating hours May through October, Monday through Saturday, 10 to 5, and Sundays, 1 to 5. And then we're open by appointment after that. You can call the museum and set up a time. We can't afford to heat all the buildings in the winter, so we heat the Legends building that houses the World War II airplanes in our exhibit building, but two other hangars are not heated. So consequently, we just don't have the traffic in the wintertime to afford to heat them. That's fair. I can understand that. I live outside of Fairbanks, Alaska, and it uh, gets brisk up there just like it does at Minot. So that is understandable. As far as other things beyond the hurricane and the Spitfire, what else do you guys have uh, just in general exhibits wise? Well, we have a lot of vintage airplanes. We have an airplane that represents every decade of powered flight from the right flyer, Curtis Pusher, a couple of Wacos, 20s and 30s Wacos, uh, Monocoupe, clipped wing, long wing coupe, stagger wing, some home built, a lot of Vintage airplanes. In the Warbird section, we have uh, C-47, DC-3, Harvard, P-40, C-model Mustang, three D-model Mustangs, a Wildcat, L-5 that flew, was in Iwo Jima, Spitfire and Hurricane, 
I'm missing something, I'm sure. Outside, we got a 106, an F-15, a T-33, an A-7, and a C-47. Got an engine display and fire truck displays. There's a lot of stuff in there. Yeah, no, that's a great our, mix of uh, all kinds of stuff. Our curator has done a wonderful job. Jenna has uh, the exhibit area up front with all the showcases. We really have a lot of neat stuff in the showcases. So it's good reading if you have time to read. Well, Warren, thank you so much for uh, coming on the show today. It's always amazing to get to speak with people that do what you do and experience Warbirds firsthand and know the history firsthand beyond just what's in books and everything. So thank you so much for sharing your story with us and the opportunities that you've been afforded, all the uh, interesting characteristics of the hurricane and the legacy that uh, she has built just very special to me. And I know the listeners can appreciate everything out there for the listeners. Please remember, go visit www.dakota territory air museum.com all one big word to see all the amazing exhibits they have on display the educational opportunities they have available typically throughout the summer and all the other ways to support their mission warren again thank you so much and for all the listeners out there we'll see you next time on the uh, warbird series definitely my pleasure thanks trevor Welcome back, everyone. My thanks again to Warren for a great conversation about the hurricane. I really had a great time with it. And I did want to make sure that I mentioned about the ownership piece of his aircraft and all the other aircraft there at the Dakota Territory Air Museum. And unlike the commemorative Air Force, who owns their all aircraft, those aircraft at the museum, or at least a fair number of them, are owned by Bruce Ames. And I want to make sure that he gets the recognition he deserves for helping to keep the history of warbirds up in the sky. So now for a change of pace. I thought it would be interesting to get another perspective on the hurricane from someone that's also flown multiple warbirds, including the hurricane, as well as various Southern modern aircraft. And so I reached out to Mr. Dan Griffith, former RAF test pilot and the chief pilot at Biggin Hill in the UK to see if he would be interested in joining me here to discuss it. And fortunately he's here to do that. So Dan, welcome to the show. Well, thanks very much. It's uh, great to be on with this uh, very illustrious crowd that you are bringing together. I appreciate your time today and hopefully we can get some good nuggets of information about the hurricane and some of the history and everything with it. So to start out, you're a RAF test pilot. You're the chief pilot at Biggin Hill. You guys have a number of aircraft at your disposal, but let's get a little bit about you and where you're coming from and how you got to where you are today. Okay. Sounds good. Well, my sort of aviation career started with joining the Air Force as a university cadet, as we call it, which is somebody that is sponsored basically by the Air Force to go through university. And I went through and did aeronautical engineering and then went on to the Air Force proper, where I went through the sort of normal training role, which was Jet Provost, and then on to Hawks. And then eventually, um, fantastically selected to go to Harriers, which was uh, superb, AV8B and AV8A in your sort of world which was a fantastic airplane and uh, superb to fly, uh, good to operate and generally a good lifestyle. However, my real passion, I suppose, is aviation in the pure sense. That's what drew me really towards the test pilot world, which is a great chance to fly lots of different airplanes and experience things uh, that you perhaps wouldn't do if you just carried on flying one jet. So I applied to go into the test world and was selected to go to Edwards out in uh, California and uh, the American uh, school there sent a guy over to the uh, British school and I went over there for my three years, uh, for my year, sorry, which was fantastic. Getting a chance to fly a wonderful set of aeroplanes, 42 different types in a year, which was quite remarkable. And it was very nice weather all the time. And my son was born there. So I've got a little American son. So that's a uh, great fun. Came back from that, went to, we had three test organizations when I first came back, which was Bedford, Farnborough and Boscombe. Bedford was a handling squadron. So I went to Bedford, which was where the VAR carrier, which was basically the prototyping machine used for the F-35 eventually. And we developed the control laws for that, which was very exciting at the time. So I did that. Then Bedford closed. I went to Boscombe, carried on with the VAR carrier with lots of other things as well obviously Gulf War and stuff like that. So I did a lot of Jaguar work and tornado work, which was also quite interesting. Then I was going to be promoted and sent back to the squadron, which wasn't my ideal. I wanted to stay in the test world, but I agreed until a job came up in our UK Civil Aviation Authority to join their test department, which was a bit of a dead man's shoes type of job. So if I didn't take it then, it probably wouldn't have come up for another 10 or 15 years and I wouldn't have been in the bracket. So I resigned from the Air Force, which was a bit sad, but went over to the dark side, to the civilian side, 
which was fantastic fun. And I really did have a, a tremendous 11 years with the CAA, flying all sorts of things there from the vintage aeroplanes, because that was my sort of hobby type style. And we didn't really have anybody in the CAA that flew the vintage aeroplanes. So I did a lot of that stuff, both vintage propellers and the vintage jets, which was great fun. But my main job was the big aircraft. So I did the big Airbus A380, the twin decker, but I also did the all the 737 new generation aircraft and lots of other things, which was just great. After the A380, I thought what's going to come along and I couldn't really see anything in the next 10 years because the supersonic jet wasn't going to be there for a while. So I thought, right, it's time to leave. And so I left and became a test consultant, I suppose, which has been very interesting. And I still am contracted to our UK CEA and I'm also contracted to the European Air Witness Safety Agency, EASA, directly, which is why I still do projects for them. So that's me in a nutshell. It's been great fun. It's been lots of interesting flying, lots of testing. And, you know, we're talking about 10,000 odd hours and 480 different types. So uh, quite a lot of interest there. I guess we could say that you know what you're talking about. So that's a good starting mm-hmm. point. So we've talked about your background. You had a chance to listen to the episode. So first, let's get a few comparisons from a different perspective, yours, on your overall impression of the hurricane and where you see it in terms of your mental model there as a test pilot. The hurricane, as we've heard from the last bits of interview, uh, was a very interesting airplane from the point of view of how it came and the way it was developed and the way it came from a biplane into a a monoplane, et cetera, et cetera. But for me, the big thing about the Hurricane was it was a workhorse, a complete workhorse, a very stable platform, very easy to fly airplane. And when we come on to talk about the Spitfire later, very different from the Spitfire, strangely. Same sort of engine, of course, but the wing was completely different. The whole feel of the airplane is completely different. It's got a very large, wide undercarriage, of course, which again makes it very different from the Spitfire, very much easier than the Spitfire to operate, particularly in this modern world. Because obviously in the Second World War time, they were basically taking off and landing on great big fields. And actually, the aeroplanes were obviously owned by the military, so the expense of them wasn't really thought of. Just like me when I was flying my Harriers, I never really thought about the cost of the aeroplane. But of course, now you transform ourselves into the modern world, and you've got somebody's private toy, if you will, in inverted commas, that's worth, you know, three, four, five million dollars. And you're also landing on a paved runway in one direction rather than in any direction into wind onto a field. Yeah. So the undercarriage becomes very important, strangely, more important almost than anything else, because from an operation point of view, the wind is never down the runway, or quite often it's not down the runway. So sure. you've got to try and land on a hard piece of concrete or tarmac, which the aircraft doesn't likely can't slip properly, et cetera, possibly with a crosswind rather than into wind. So when you've got a little tiny narrow undercarriage, a bit like Spitfire and the ME109s, it becomes quite difficult because they're very susceptible to the wind and weather cocking into wind and ground looping and all that sort of stuff. But the Hurricane, in complete contrast with its large wide undercarriage like the Mustang, is very nice in a crosswind. So it takes all that pressure away from you. And particularly when you're in the display world, which is obviously most of the time these airplanes have flown nowadays. And the problem with the display world is that you have to try and get to the display. (laughs) So quite often, of course, you will fly in weather conditions that if you were just an owner just going up for the afternoon and having a quick flight, you wouldn't go in. Yeah. But you've got to try and get there. So you push yourself a little bit more, which always gives you a bit more of an interest factor, especially when the wind is not how you want it. Whereas the, the Hurricane was always nice. I operated, we had a car group here called AC Cars, which is AC Cobra, and they owned a Hurricane when they went to bankrupt many, many years ago, 20-odd years ago now. And I got to operate there hurricane for about 18 months before it was sold and it was an absolute delight it didn't really matter what sort of wind you're in it was always nice and easy to land so you never really felt the pressure that you do when you come back in with a crosswind in a spitfire so those to me are the great factors of the hurricane it was a very stable airplane generally a shorter nose you could nearly always see better and the great thing about it the main thing about it for me was the undercarriage which was just a delight to land on yeah, no, that seems like the trend, the undercarriage or the landing gear for yeah. the non-British English yeah, sorry, the, the folks out gear. there. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so if you had to 
put it out there. I'm going to ask a couple of the same questions from our listeners that I asked to Warren. The first was from Greg Lund. What is the fundamental difference between the hurricane and the Spitfire? If you had to narrow it down to like one thing. Okay. One thing for me overall is one of them is a Cadillac, which is the hurricane. The other one is a Ferrari, which is a Spitfire. That is in a nutshell. The hurricane is that stable, reliable type of airplane, whereas the Spitfire is that agile little fighter. And that is the main difference for me. It's the difference in the flying qualities of the airplane. And they are chalk and cheese, very much so. When you're sitting in them, you sort of get the feeling that they're pretty similar. Obviously, the Spitfire's got this little cockpit that you strap on. The Hurricane is with its glass type of sort of more uh, different canopy doesn't feel quite strapped on. But the difference really is the way they fly. And one of them is a very reliable gunship, platform, whatever you want to say, uh, Cadillac. And one of them is a very agile little fighter. That makes a lot of sense. Mm. From Ivan, and this is Paul's dad, Terry, asking this question. Was the hurricane underappreciated for its successes in World War II just oh, because it was doubt. overshadowed by the Spitfire? Without doubt. And yeah. I was at Bingham Hill the day before yesterday doing some passenger flying in a two-seater, and we got into this discussion. Why was the hurricane not as appreciated as much as the Spitfire? And it has to be looks. The Spitfire, with its elliptical wings, with its sleekness, yeah. looks beautiful. It just has that dreamy sort of look about it. In the Second World War, it was that fighter ace type of airplane that was put out in the PR, perhaps wrongly, because as you say, there were more hurricanes and there were more kills to put down to hurricane, but it was put out there as that romantic saviour of the UK. And that stuck. There is no doubt that has absolutely stuck. When you look at the two airplanes, here I am 80 years later flying these airplanes. And to be honest, I love the looks of the Spitfire. I love the handling of the Spitfire and the romance of the Spitfire. And the Hurricane, as you say, has got better history to some extent, but it doesn't invoke that same image in the minds of the Brits. Yeah, I'd agree. I think obviously it's very obvious from the history books. The notoriety, I think, of the Spitfire is just yes. it's well more known than the Hurricane for sure. Sven, and this will be the last one from the listener questions that I asked, but he asked what the actual strengths of the hurricane are that made it effective in the Battle of Britain. The main strengths were the steady gun platform that it was. As I said, if you look at the Spitfire and the Hurricane, as I said, you've got this agile Spitfire and you've got this more stable Hurricane. But when you're trying to fire guns, of course, and you're trying to aim at something, and don't forget, the aiming systems of the day were quite primitive, not like they are now with predictive gun sights and all this sort of stuff. What you wanted was a very, very stable platform to fire from at another airplane or whether it's a bomb or whether it's a gun onto the ground. What you need is to be able to sit there and set yourself up. And the Hurricane was very good at that. It was a very, very stable airplane. It didn't twitch is probably the best word to use, like the Spitfire did. I think that was the success of it, and that's why it was so successful, because it was so stable, you could aim properly, and you could get your either bullets onto a target, whether that was in the air or on the ground, or whether it was a bomb on a target or a rocket or whatever it was. That was the overriding factor. Yeah, that makes sense for sure. Well, more of opinion-based questions. What's your favorite thing about the Hurricane from your experience flying it? I suppose you have got the great history as well. That is definitely there because even though the wider public, I suppose, look at the Spitfire as the savior, anybody that's really into these airplanes, into the history of these airplanes, know that the Hurricane had a great massive part to play. And actually, as we've said, probably what well, did have more kills and more strikes than Spitfire did. To me, that's the great bit about the Hurricane. Also, the Hurricane, of course, because of the sort of romance and notoriety of the Spitfire, there aren't that many hurricanes around. So flying rarer aeroplanes, as we like to do, the hurricane is nice to be able to say, yes, I've been in a hurricane and I've flown a hurricane. Yeah, no, that's a great little piece there. Well, on the flip side of that, just like I asked Warren, he said the heating in the aircraft was <laughs> uh, a little less than desirable. What's your least favorite characteristic? 
I'm not a least favorite characteristic type of person. I, I'm afraid I just like airplanes for what they are. People often ask me, what's your favorite? What's your worst? I can't really say that even on airplanes, never mind in characteristic airplanes, because an airplane is what it is. You've got to accept, you know, the whole design is what makes the hurricane. If you were to change lots of it, then it wouldn't be a hurricane. So, you know, accept it for what it is, enjoy it for what it is. I haven't really got any weak side of it. As I say, I like the things about it, like the undercarriage, and I like the uh, history of it. To be honest, no, I haven't really got much like to say I don't really like I would change because you'd change the hurricane now. Now you're just playing politics. That's too good an answer. <laughs> All right. Well, the final question for you today, Dan, you've flown both the hurricane and Spitfire. And this is my most asked listener question. Do you have a preference on which one you get to go fly? I am very sorry to say that I would pick a Spitfire every day. All right. And the enough. reason I pick a Spitfire every day is because it is such a delight to fly. You feel that you strap it on. You feel that those elliptical wings are connected to your hips. It talks to you when it gets close to a limit. It tells you. It's beautifully harmonized. You've got a great view out of it. You've got, as you have in the Hurricane, the right sound and the right smells, the right vibration of that thoroughbred engine in front of you. But the elliptical wings are what cut it for me. The slenderness of the wings, because the Hurricane wings are quite chunky, the slenderness, the beauty, and the flying qualities are contrastingly different. The Hurricane, for me, has the history, has that side of it. The Spitfire has the history. Let's take that aside. But if you were just looking at an airplane to fly today without its history, every pilot that got into a Spitfire would enjoy it, irrespective of its history, because it's such a delight to fly. It really is. Well, yeah, I think everybody would prefer to fly something they like to fly or flies well, as opposed yeah. to maybe not as well. So that's a great answer. I appreciate that. Well, as we start to wrap up today, Dan, this won't be the last time that we're going to hear from you because we are going Excellent. to talk about the Spitfire in an upcoming episode. Uh, I don't know exactly when that's going to air, but we'll have you back onto the show. So I look forward to that conversation. And once again, thanks so much for stopping by. Uh, right. You're on Instagram and here's the Instagram handle for everybody. Everybody can go check out what he's up to. He's got a ton of different types of things that are going on in his world, as he mentioned, kind of in his upfront bio there, but uh, his Instagram handle is at Dan underscore Griffith, G R I F F I T H underscore test underscore pilot. Maybe we'll work on that. Dan, we'll do a listener uh, call out to get you a better Instagram handle, but everybody go <laughs> check out uh, what he's got going on. And uh, Dan, we'll see you back in a few episodes from now. Fantastic. Thanks very much for having me on. Looking forward to the next one. Definitely. Well, for everybody out there, that will do it for today. My thanks again to Warren at the Dakota Territory Air Museum and to Dan again for stopping by. And for those that already uh, haven't switched over to Instagram, again, at Dan underscore Griffith underscore test underscore pilot and check out what he's got going on. For everybody here at the podcast, we'll see you next time for the next installment of the Fighter Pilot Podcast. But until then, get high, get fast and do some good work. We'll see you. You've been listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, brought to you by BVR Productions. Got a question for the show? Email us at questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to follow us on your favorite social media platform and check out our website, fighterpilotpodcast.com. For exclusive content and to help support the show, check out our Patreon page. Thanks for listening.